Hello, this is Georgina Rose, part-time esoteric content creator and part-time center of pestilence. And welcome back to the Dr. Darling YouTube channel. On this channel, we discuss religion, mysticism, the occult, philosophy, and everything on the fringes of esoterica. And in this video, we're gonna be talking about a much more sort of philosophic topic, I guess. I've been thinking about this a lot recently, and it's a discussion I really wanna have. And that would be about virtue. So what is virtue? I think most people's immediate association with the word virtue is virtue is things a good person is or does, and that is part of it. But did you know that virtue is metaphysically real and exist? So many people associate this idea of being a good person being built into theology with particularly a Christian worldview, right? Growing up here in the West, I grew up in America, right? We were in a heavily Christian culture. And so our associations of good, evil, etc., come from that lens. And so when we think of virtue, we think of essentially the things that the church teaches. We think about those things that are traditionally considered virtues in that sense. However, they are not the only people who have a sense of morality or virtue in their worldview. In fact, the ancient pagans were deeply focused on this. If you look at Platonism, one of the key ideas followed by pagans in the Hellenistic world, as Plato was a polytheist, um, he talks a lot about this idea of virtue and goodness. And so it's pretty clear that pagans did have a sense of morality. In the neo-pagan community, I have seen many, many people sort of make the argument that morality is not real. Morality is this latent Christian thing that you need to release yourself from in order to be a good occultist. And I think that is just so obviously wrong. I think it is true that morality is complicated. Morality is not always super black and white. Personally, I think that it's relative up until a point and then it is objectively real, right? In a sense, your nation is going to impact how you view morality, right? Because culture and identity and our heritage is going to, you know, affect the way that we see things, right? But there are still some things that are objectively right and objectively wrong. And because of that, we need to understand virtue, even as a Thelemite, which is the tradition that I am the most connected to, I would also call myself a perennialist. Um, Thelema is a relatively open-ended system, but even within Thelema, we do have these ideas there. In Thelema, it is seen as objectively good to have willpower, to be strong. And Thelema makes it very clear when Crowley talks about this idea called the slave shall serve, which is a dramatic sounding sentence. But what it implies is that there are people who through their willpower and through their dedication and through their virtue can become, you know, very, you know, successful, empowered, mystically rich people. But if you do not connect to will, you essentially become a slave who serves. And so because of that, that even applies that as a Thelemite, you still need to think about these things. And so I want to talk about basically things that I would consider key virtues. I made a list of 10 because 10 is a pretty number. I think it's nice and even. It's a good number. But before I get into the list, I want to talk about where I got these virtues from and where I, you know, came up with this stuff. So the first point that I wanted to look at is history. So when we talk about paganism, even if you're in a very revivalist sect, for me, I am not a reconstructionist. I do not consider my personal mission to perfectly reconstruct what the European people were doing prior to the conversion. I'm really not interested in that. Though I still value the history and think about that when I am developing my path and talking about this stuff. History matters. However, I do not feel like I need to be enslaved to history, enslaved to doing exactly what the historic pagans did to have a successful religious understanding. Because if paganism had survived from the conversion when it ended to now, it would have changed radically. If we look to the East, we can see Hinduism, as Hinduism is a polytheistic system. There's been a lot of evolution within Hinduism from that period to now. So, I think the obsession with recreating the past is sometimes not great. And as well, the thing with paganism that sucks is a lot of these different pagan traditions do not have good records left behind. And the records that were left behind are mostly written by Christians who obviously had a biased slant in what they were writing. And so to try to perfectly reconstruct stuff is always going to not be perfect. And you're always gonna need to fill things in. 
in general, my view on tradition is that there's a lot of wisdom in tradition. There's a lot of wisdom in the ancient world. I wouldn't be talking about this stuff if I didn't believe that. But there are some things that I think we need to modify and adapt to create, you know, the optimum system, right? We should take what we know is great and valuable from the ancients and what tradition is important, and then syncretize that with more new ideas to create sort of the ultimate syncretic system to move forward with, right? Because you can value the ideas that the ancients held while still wanting plumbing. There, you don't need to choose between the two. And so that's why I would say I value tradition, but I am not a true reconstructionist. But I did still think that some of the stuff that the historic pagans thought, believes, and did should be impacting this list. And so that was heavily considered. As well, I wanted to look at mythology. Mythology is interesting because myths were a lot of things. I know in modern life, we often see myths as like cool stories that you read in English class when you're in high school, and then you sort of, you know, discard it, leave it be. But myths are rich. They have actual historic events in them, though they're typically a little embezzled. I wouldn't consider them history textbooks. Um, but there are also great lessons, and the lessons within the myths are things that we should internalize and take seriously. They are the wisdom of the ancients, and we should seriously consider that. As well, there are theological truths. Now, there's a huge debate within all of religion, not even just within paganism, about are the myths literally true? Are they literal history and all that? And there is a lot of debate about that. I'm not going to say you have to believe one thing or the other, but I like to think of it as it's history with some embellishment, right? Because the thing is with these myths, there are a lot of different tellings of them. And even reading one myth, you're going to see like 10 different versions of the same myth because they were mostly passed on orally with some people writing them down. But even then the written versions can sometimes vary. So I think it's always good to remember that. But that was another thing I really wanted to pull from. As well, I wanted to pull from the actual philosophers of the pagan period, right? The philosophers before the conversion happened, what they were saying, because obviously they are informed by the religion of their period. There is no way to go throughout the world and not be impacted by your culture and the religious mindsets of that period. So I wanted to throw all that together. And then I wanted to add some personal observations based on my personal life and experience of the world for things that I would consider virtues. So without further ado, here is my list of virtues that I think every pagan, mystic, whatever you want to call yourself, honestly, I'm going to extend this to all people. I think all people should strive for these things and consider them seriously. So let's break into it. The first thing on this list is one that may raise a few eyebrows, but I'm going to explain why I chose it so that it's a little more clear. And that would be beauty. By beauty, I do not mean having a thick booty or a contour on fleek. That's not what I'm talking about. I am talking about beauty as a virtue. So if you read these older philosophers, you're going to notice they talk about beauty a lot. And they say beauty is objectively good. And they sort of argue that beauty is not as subjective as we have recently been told to believe. And to this, I would agree. When you see something beautiful, you see a beautiful ritual space, an ancient Roman statue, you see a majesty of the gods in it. And you look at that and you can connect to that and immediately recognize that as something valuable, something spiritually enriching and powerful. And so that is what I mean by beauty. In a sense, if you love beauty, you are loving what the gods created, as the world was created by the gods. And so to understand beauty, to appreciate beauty, to recognize that beauty is real and existing, is an appreciation of divinity and is spiritually valuable. Beauty is more than something that's pretty to look at. It is deep and it is virtuous. And in a sense, it is goodness. So the next thing on this list is something that I think pretty much anyone who follows me knows I'm going to put in somewhere and that'll be discipline. I am a huge advocate for discipline. I think if you live an undisciplined life, you are basically living a meaningless life. Aleister Crowley had a really interesting quote, and I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't have it in front of me right now, where it was, without discipline, the most whole collection of talents is entirely worthless. Or is it without willpower? It's either without willpower or without discipline. But Either way, I think it's a great quote. You can be given so many gifts coming into this world and have so many talents, but if you don't have the follow through or the work or the discipline to actualize those talents, you are missing out. As well, if you have any desire of spiritual development, if you want you know, to unite with the gods, you want to have a good reincarnation, you want to have a good life, you need discipline. You cannot just sit around and expect the world to cater to you. That is not reality. And if you want spiritual growth, it is the same. If you want to sit around and never practice, you are never going to have growth. And I know that is harsh to hear, but it is the reality. And you know what? I'm going to help you a little bit. 
So this video is actually partnered with a group called Aura Health, which is a meditation app. And this app is really, really cool. They call themselves the Spotify of meditation and they have over 5 million downloads on the app store. They basically are an app that has tons of guided meditations in it. You pull it up, you turn it on and you can listen to these things. And I personally have been trying it out. Uh, Aura Health has been really lovely. And so I've been messing with it. And you know, every night I try to meditate just for a little bit. Sometimes I do it in the morning, sometimes at night, depending. And you know, I've kind of been slacking a little bit recently, which is sort of, I mean, me admitting that I'm not always the perfect virtuous person. I'm a human, I'm still growing, I'm still trying, I'm still working. And Aura Health has really helped me, you know, get it a little more back in line because they mix things up. I was following a pattern of doing the same meditations and with Aura Health's guided meditations, I was able to really mix it up and, you know, evolve my personal spiritual practice. So if you want to check out Aura Health, I'm going to have a link in the description box. And thank you so much to Aura Health for helping make this video possible. My next virtue is love. In Philema, we think of love as the word agape. And agape, geometrically, actually adds up to 93. But let's talk about that for a second. So if we in Thelema mean agape by love, that must mean that there are other types of love. Interestingly, in the Greek world, there are a list of different types of love and they represent our love with different things. And by understanding love, by connecting with love, one can learn so many spiritual mysteries. In the modern day, I've seen this depressing trend of people calling things like marriage just a piece of paper. In reality, things like love, marriage, and even sex have a spiritual dimension to them. They have a metaphysic meaning, they have a history. And so if you even understand love on the personal level and can connect to that emotion, you're actually experiencing immense spiritual growth. And there is a reason why so many mystics have been intrigued by love for so long. And in almost every single religion's holy text somewhere, there is a story of an incredible love leading people to do incredible things. Things. But even then, I mean, love can just be between the parent and child. And there are many myths about parents being able to do anything for their children. And so, yes, love is a virtue. I think love is something that everyone should experience. And hopefully everyone does at some point in their life for at least someone or something. If not a person, at least you can experience it for the divine. And that in and of itself is a beautiful thing. So my next virtue is strength. Strength is really, really important. And by strength, I do not mean punching a hole in drywall when someone insults you. I mean the metaphysical strength. When you look at the tarot, there is a card called strength. And what's interesting is on the cover of that card or the front of the card, I guess it's not the cover, you know what I mean? There's a person petting a lion, a fearsome lion that could eat them if they want to, but they are able to pet them because they are strong and emotionally resilient enough to, you know, pet the little lion, right? And that I think is a really interesting way of viewing strength. And as well, um, even brute strength sometimes has a value, right? Sometimes we need people who are willing to defend, who are willing to stand up and who are willing to fight for something. Strength is valuable and strength keeps us going even through the hard times. And so it is so important to be strong and to work on that. And trust me, I am not always the strongest person in the world. I am not exactly a, a weightlifter, I'll just say that. But it's something that I'm working on. And that's the thing about virtue. Virtue are goals. They are things you aspire to. And obviously you're gonna have times when you are more virtuous than others and you're going to have failings and you're gonna have success. But that's okay because you are continuing to work, you are continuing to grow, you are continuing to evolve. And that's what matters. The next virtue is perseverance. If you're on a spiritual journey, there are many times you're going to persevere. In the Western tradition, a term that gets thrown a lot is crossing the abyss or the dark night of the soul. They are very similar concepts. So I'm gonna kind of put them in the same category. Um, and what that is, is basically a deep, hard, emotional, raw, spiritual part of your journey where you're essentially going through the darkest night. You're crossing the darkest abyss. And through this, the way to continue across is to persevere, to keep working, and to remember that even when it may seem as if God is far away from you and you are alone in the world, you are not actually alone. To be able to persevere is one of the ultimate strengths and values a person can have because life is hard. We are living in hard times. No matter what ideological perspective you come from, we are in a hard time. And to get through that, you need to be able to persevere. You need to be able to persevere in a cultural sense, in your personal life, and through all levels. And so it is something that we should always be working on, always continue to work on. And honestly, if you're watching this video, you probably have persevered at some point or another because, you know, it's a hard world, right? Perseverance is something we are constantly engaging with. The next one is justice. Uh, justice as a term is an interesting one because I find that people twist the word justice a lot. 
Justice is not going crazy on anyone who you dislike and being an absolute piece of shit. That is not justice. That is not finding justice. So judgment and justice, I think, are sort of buddies in the world. Because to seek out justice, you have to be able to judge. And I think me mentioning the word judgment for anyone coming from a Christian background may sound odd because people are always taught to love, not judge. But in a sense, judgment is important because it is discretion. It is determining what is good, what is bad. And it's our natural radar for knowing what's helping us versus what's hurting us. And justice is judgment when taken in a right way, right? Because judgment can be used to be mean. It can be used to be like, oh my God, that girl's shoes are so ugly, ew, right? That, that's not justice. That is judgment, but that is not justice. Justice would be if you've seen someone be cruel to someone else um, to say, hey, maybe don't do that. Of course, I do not think we should witch burn people. I don't think we should take people out and tar and feather them. I don't think that's typically justice, to be honest. It's trying to seek for a more fair world for everyone and trying to make people's lives better. That is what justice is. Justice is not, um, I'm gonna bully people because they did something mean first. No, justice is seeking out a more just and balanced world. This one is a slightly complicated one. I think that confidence is a virtue, but we gotta talk about confidence because confidence often goes hand in hand with ego. And every single spiritual tradition will teach you that ego can be a problem. And the interesting thing about that is that we all have ego. People also talk, people often talk about this idea of ego death or killing the ego or destroying the ego. The thing is you can't really do that because the ego at its most core level is the self. To destroy the ego is to destroy the self. However, if the ego is too big, it becomes pride. That's the difference between confidence and pride. Confidence is being like, I know I'm doing great. I'm able to take criticism. I'm able to, you know, get through hard times, able to stand for my values and my principles and know I'm doing a good thing, even if the world doesn't think I'm doing a good thing. But pride is when you think you are great for no reason. You, you take it really far. And so I think confidence is good as long as confidence is in a balanced state. In general, all of these traits can become bad if they become overkill. If we look at astrology, there are these planets called the benefics. That would be the sun, planets like that. And a little bit of that is really important. That's why they are called benefic. They typically bring good things into the, the life of the people engaging with it. But if they are taken too far, they actually end up becoming a problem because all of life is about living in a state of balance and harmony. When things become unbalanced, they almost always become toxic. My next virtue is creativity. So creativity in this sense means a lot of things. The first would be generation. So as people, we are able to generate new life. We are able to create things. And that's really what creativity is, right? Creativity is the ability to generate, to bring new into the world. And in a sense, the most divine act in the world is to bring forth life. The thing is, we don't necessarily just need to bring forth life. We can bring forth art, we can bring forth growth, we can bring forth new ideas. And creativity gives us that power to create, to generate, to expand, which is something that people desperately need to do. Sometimes, and I have been guilty of this myself, turning myself in, we can be so focused on deconstructing things that we are never creating anything new, right? We're just destroying, 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 ripping apart, ripping apart, ripping apart, going scorched earth. We never have anything replace it, right? When we look at the journey of the tarot, the tower collapses. And after the tower collapses, there are more cards. Things are rebuilt. If you are just destroying, 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 even if you're destroying for a good reason, you are not building anything new. And thus you are not being creative. What is important is to know when to destroy and when to create and how to live in that state of balance between these two forces. My next virtue is devotion. So this is one of the most important things in the world. I remember I read this book, uh, it was called Holy Damon. And one of the lines, I think it was right towards the front was, mysticism is the child of discipline and devotion. And I remember that has always really, really stuck with me because it's true. Devotion is everything and being devoted to something, having a passion for something and being able to honor something and do that is a virtue. If you want any sort of spiritual development, you have to learn to devote. I've seen often this phrasing of working with deities and I actually used it myself. I still sometimes do. But the thing is, working with is not the same of worshiping and I don't know necessarily devoting yourself to something if you are 
working with something. If you are using something to get an ends versus to honor something, that's very, very different. And I think sometimes we need to learn to humble ourselves and to honor and to devote and to worship things and to acknowledge that we as individuals are not always the center of the entire universe and to devote ourselves to something higher. Devotion doesn't always need to be spiritual, by the way. You can devote yourself to a movement, to a concept, devote yourself to something because without that, we are sometimes purposeless. As a Thelemite, I believe in the idea of will. I think that will can bring ultimate power into your life. And by understanding and tapping into will, you can do anything. True will is powerful and you can essentially become one of the greatest people in the world through your will alone. But to do that, it does take devotion, right? Will is made up of a complex arrangement of things to have that level of impact. And so devotion is key. Devote yourself to something, even if it's not a God, even if it's not a religion, an idea. Devote yourself to something. Give your life some sort of meaning. It will make it all easier. And my final virtue is one that I think is acutely relevant right now, and that would be hope. As human beings, we are demoralized constantly. We are told these very dark nihilistic, not in the sense of like Nietzsche nihilism, just like in the colloquial sense of nihilism things all the time. I remember I saw some tweets the other day where it was someone saying that it's wrong to have kids because their life's gonna suck because the world is hard. I've seen other takes like this too. I've been like, oh, there's no point in finding love because all men are going to be mean to you, right? So women, we should just give up and become so solo forever, right? I see stuff like this all the time. It affects all aspects of life. Some people say, well, beauty standards are really high. So there's no point in trying to be pretty. There's so many versions of this, right? There is no point because of this, this, and this. And what that lacks is hope. That is ultimately despair. In Christianity, despair is actually considered the ultimate sin. There is few, there are few sins greater than the idea that, well, I have lived such a horrible life that even if I confess my sins, even if I annul everything, I could not be saved, right? And obviously I'm not a Christian. I don't agree with that in that sense, but I think there's a lesson to be learned by that. If you are truly in a state of pure despair and without hope, you are in a sense laughing at the gods. You you are, you're saying that these, these gods created the world. They did all this stuff. And you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna laugh in their face because my life is so hard. I should have no hope. I should just give up. I should just doom scroll and watch TikTok videos about how society's falling apart, right? That, that That's not what you're supposed to do. And you should have hope and having hope is powerful and important. So now that I've gone through my list, I wanted to give sort of my final thoughts. And that would be, how do you do all this stuff? Obviously you're not gonna wake up tomorrow and have all of these traits down pat, right? It, it's work, it's process, it's time. And I think that connecting to your spiritual path is gonna be really vital in this. Achieving these virtues is really easier when you have a religious backing to it, right? Religion is something that people need. We, we do on a fundamental level. We want something more than this existence. We crave something higher. We crave meaning, we crave depth. And through tapping into that and understanding that, we can integrate it into our lives and strive to live a better one and to be more virtuous. So thank you so much for watching. That's really all I have to say on this topic. Uh, first of all, thank you to Aura Health for making this video possible. Check out their, their app. But if you wanna support me and enable me to make more videos so I can keep talking, cause I will never stop. Uh, you can support me on Patreon. You get extra videos every month. You get these videos all early. You get, um, you get to meet with me if you're high enough tier. You get my ritual guides, which have been over 20 pages for the past few months. It's basically like 20 pages of my writing and of my rituals and recipes. There's a lot of fun stuff in there. Um, I also host the podcast, The Postmodern Iconic Glass, which you can watch here or on podcasting platforms. I'm also on Instagram, Twitter, Telegram, and TikTok. I'm pretty much everywhere. I don't know where you can't find me. Oh, and if you want to make a direct donation, Ko-Fi is the way to do that. No fees, no commitment, just one off. So thank you so much for watching. Like, comment, subscribe, and subscribe for 93 days and you will never need to know what a virtue is. All right.